Christine Sinclair. International soccer's all-time leading goal scorer, Olympic champion. Today is Friday, August 6th, and this is Tokyo Daily, the Olympic show from the Toronto Star. I'm Brendan Dunlop. What a day. The Canadian women's soccer team made history Friday morning. And what a Friday morning it was for Canadians. The women's soccer team beating Sweden in a penalty shootout to win Olympic gold for the very first time. And it was a long time coming. Sweden were the bookies' favorites, coming into a match that was relocated. The kickoff time wisely pushed back 10 hours to be played under the lights in Yokohama. The Swedes struck first. They had Canadians on pins and needles a few times with some threatening attacks. Christine Sinclair again drew a second half penalty that VAR confirmed and again handed the ball to Jesse Fleming. The responsibility all on the 23 year old who delivered again, putting Canada on level terms and swinging the momentum and the belief in Canada's favor. There were some nervy moments, definitely. Nervy moments and extra time. And you may not have been able to breathe in that penalty shootout, but Canada outlasted Sweden. Stephanie Labbe's sixth round save to deny Jonah Anderson sent 20-year-old Julia Grosso to the spot and her gold medal winning penalty delivered the historic golden moment for the Canadian women's soccer team. I'll get to it all with Laura Armstrong. You can tell I'm a little excited. This means a lot for the Canadian soccer community. It means a lot for Canadian soccer. Here's how 2012 bronze medalist Kaylin Kyle reacted. I'm literally so happy right now. I'm proud of the team, I'm proud of SYNC. So happy for Canada. This is why I love the f-ing Olympics. Everyone who has ever played with Christine Sinclair, every one of those players on the pitch in Yokohama with her today, even her biggest rival, Abby Wambach, tweeted during the match, I want this for Sinky. Everyone knew what it meant for such an icon of the game. She now has a gold medal for all that she's done for the sport of soccer. And that's amazing. I hope you had two screens Friday morning because Andre de Grasse won another medal. He has stood on the podium in every Olympic event he's ever run in. Andre de Grasse adding a bronze to the collection, powering Canada's 4x100 meter relay team to a third place finish behind silver medalist Great Britain and Lamont Marcel Jacobs' Italy, as they were fast. Canada, comprised of de Grasse, Aaron Brown, Brendan Rodney, and Jerome Blake, finished with a time of 37.70. Three medals in Tokyo to go with three medals in Rio puts Andre de Grasse one medal back of Canada's recently minted most decorated Olympian, Penny Alexiak, who has seven. Paris can't come soon enough. Canada secured three medals in less than an hour on Friday. In the 1500 meter race at Olympic Stadium, Mohamed took silver in his second Olympic games. He is the Canadian record holder and North America's fastest 5,000 meter runner of all time. And now he's an Olympic medalist. That's pretty cool for the 30 year old from St. Catharines. And before you went to bed, Evan Dunphy changed his Twitter profile from Olympic non-medalist to Olympic bronze medalist, finishing third in the last 50 meter race walk on the Olympic calendar. A four medal Friday. That means that Canada has matched the 22 medal haul from Rio, something that was unthinkable heading into these games with all the restrictions and all the obstacles that Canadian athletes face just getting to these Olympic games. Speaking of things that once seemed unthinkable, very happy to talk about Canada's gold medal historic day in Yokohama with Laura Armstrong from the Toronto Star. Laura, how do you feel after that? I I don't know. I don't I I don't know. Same. I, like I feel uh, incredible, but I also feel like it hasn't hit me. But at the end of the game, my hands were shaking so badly I could barely type. Like it was just it was a really incredible incredible moment to see and I'm just I mean I'm overjoyed for the team and I'm overjoyed for all the fans in the country that got to watch uh just an incredible incredible match today that's awful. the thing incredible yeah awful at times yeah also uh, I mean, that penalty shootout was an emotional bleeping roller coaster <laughs> I think it's important to state that you know because there, there will be hate comments we are journalists you considerably more credible than I but we are passionate and invested in the sport of soccer because we love it. And it's not homerism, but celebrating the moment and recognizing the moment. 
and seeing how the world recognizes this moment as well that you know Christine Sinclair is one of the all-time greats of the game not the women's game the game and how important it is that she on that resume has you know the highest honor one of the highest honors in all of soccer uh, certainly in the women's game that is incredible uh, from Abby Wambach's tweet to just seeing the reaction all around um, obviously this team we went to Tokyo with a collective goal of, of uh, changing the color of the medal and winning gold for Sinclair in what is likely her last Olympics but who knows Paris is just a, a three years away um, to, to see them do it she wasn't on the pitch for the penalty shootout but just to see what it meant for everybody there if you love Canadian soccer if you've been to a game before if you have a child that plays in it this was a moment for everybody to share and take part in. And we haven't had those in this country. No, not soccer wise. I mean, we've had those throughout these Olympics in terms of all of the athletes who have celebrated, you know, Andre de Grasse, Damian Warner, the swimmers. I and mean, we've really had um, some incredible moments over the course of this games. And this is just an, an, another incredible moment. And I think, you know, journalists celebrate the best story. And this is the best story that Canadian fans could have was that the Canadian team would come out um, on top. And I certainly think that, you know, you hold teams to, you hold teams to the, the highest standard and you say, you know, we want you to be great. And there've been times that I've been critical of this team and there's been times that I've celebrated this team. And I think that both of those, uh, the, the root of both of those approaches is the fact that you're passionate about Canadian soccer and you're passionate about um, wanting Canadian soccer to be the best that it can be and be the top team in the world and today for once for the first time Canada soccer is the top team in the world and that's incredible it really is and you can see from the emotion of everyone involved um, I showed a clip in the show from Kaylin Kyle um, who won bronze in in London in 2012 everyone's seen Karine LeBlanc on CBC's coverage and how emotional she's been when the camera's been on actually dialed it back and held it back a little bit uh, after the gold medal win today which I thought was incredible but you know reps she's had six games to celebrate now that the biggest one that she manifested she knew that was coming but for everyone involved to, to, to see um, you know these these players um, reach the top of, mm -hmm. of their sport and put Canada on, on top of the world um, with an Olympic gold medal really really was amazing in the penalty shootout, watching <laughs> Steph Labbe, watching it yeah. go back and forth the way that it did. The composure of Julia Grosso at the end, it's funny because I know you've had this experience as well with several either older or very recently retired players. They always say they envy the young players. They mm -hmm. envy the, f and what they envy specifically is this fearlessness that they have. They remember having had it and they lose it at some point. Perhaps it's a big contract. Perhaps it's you know, wishful thinking. It's a big tournament. It's a family. They always lose this fearlessness at some point. And it's what they envy about the young players. And when Grosso stepped up, I knew she was going to score that. There was just something about it. Yeah, I mean, listen, it wasn't the best penalty in the world. I mean, Lindvall knew where she was going, but she hit it hard enough. And sometimes that's what you have to do. You just have to hit it hard enough. And I certainly think that Julia Grosso went up there like a 20-year-old. And as you said, sometimes when you're 20, you don't have those experiences of, of loss, of, of having the weight of a win on your shoulder. And I mean, having the weight of a gold medal win on their shoulder is huge. But I thought to myself, like, who is going to take this penalty? And if you had asked me if Julia Grosso was going to be the player to take it, I would have said, absolutely not and then it's Julia Grosso who walks up there with this energy that's just kind of like I've got it and she did and it, it, it's incredible it, it was it, it was an incredible tournament for Julia Grosso I don't think that she got enough credit for what she did over the course of this tournament um, because I, I really do think that she uh, took a huge step in her game in Tokyo she she really was a great connector between the midfield and the defense and I think that you know that was really important for this Canadian team they need more players like that and it's great to see that Julia Grosso has sort of stepped into that role and I think can only grow from here um, but for, for her to have that sort of energy and for her to have that fearlessness going into, into that shot, especially considering the Canadians penalty shooting was not great today, um, is, is pretty incredible. Same with Deanne Rose. She's only 22 years old. Like, I mean, that was a, that was a big moment for Deanne Rose and to, to push that to sudden death was huge. That being said, when we're talking about fearlessness, Stephanie LeBay exuded yes. fearlessness. Uh, and you kind of had this feeling going into the penalty shootout that, Stephanie LeBay, with Stephanie LeBay between the posts, Canada was going to be able to pull it off, and they did because of her. Canada was going to be okay with LeBay. Yeah, that's that's how I felt uh, <laughs> watching it as well. Uh, two massive defensive clearances, uh, Ashley Lawrence on the goal line, and then it, in uh, was it extra time that Sweden had the ball picking around in the box? I, I thought you know Sweden's attack was 
quite composed at times. They were considerably more threatening than Canada through through parts of the game there. But it seemed as the match went on, they tired. And I think fear really crept in an extra time for Sweden, and they were playing for penalties. Yeah, I would say that I think Sweden was the better team for the first, you know, 65 minutes. I think that, you know, they, they were really using the flanks well. Their crosses was really good. That's something that Canada is going to look at and think, how can we do that? Because they were crossing the ball incredibly well. And I think that that really kept Canada on their heels. Uh, I mean, I think Canada did a couple things really well. When they went down after that goal, they didn't become too emotional. It, it felt like at that point, things were getting a little out of hand and people were starting to be a little bit, um, you know, frantic almost, but they didn't do anything silly. And that was very important. They made sure that they got to half time and they earned the chance to regroup. And that's exactly what they did. I think it's incredibly important. And I don't think that we can, we can, um, under um, undermine the work that yeah understate the work that Bev Priestman did today Bev Priestman went on the attack after at halftime by bringing on Liam by bringing on Grosso that was huge and I don't think that Canadian coaches in the past have had that kind of bravery and I think that Bev Priestman was incredibly brave in that moment to do that and then to bring on Deanne Rose in the 60 second minute I was one who was saying don't take Nichelle Prince out it was the right move Similarly with bringing out Christine Sinclair, it would have been unfathomable years ago to, to take Christine Sinclair out. And yet, you know, uh, Bev Priestman did that and it was important. Jordan Heidemann was huge in, in extra time. So I think that Canada, after that goal, after they tied the game, Jesse Fleming, another incredible penalty, three on the tournament. It was pretty impressive or four on the tournament, four on the tournament. And I mean, she's incredible, but I, I really do think that um, Canada sort of, played better in the last 25 minutes and then they played well through the first period of extra time the second period of extra time if anybody was going to win it for me it would have been sweden sweden was was attacking and canada you could tell had played that extra extra time game they had more tired legs so yes. um, i certainly think that sweden had their opportunities and that goal line clearance and what was it the 118th minute was it was that late it's they come to win yeah. um, but I mean, Canada, Canada knew it was what it was doing. And, and really going back to Le Bay, when you have that foundation, when you have that person backing you and you are able to be confident going into a penalty shootout, that's something that you can't buy. It's incredible that Canada had that. All of the stories in the days uh, in a tournament, they kind of blend together. You yeah. wrote a story about Quinn this week, yes? Yeah, yes. What do you think the image of Quinn on a podium with a gold medal around their neck. What do you think that image will be for, for the world? I think it's going to be incredible. I think that Quinn is um, extremely brave for coming out and for, um, you know, being an openly trans person, being an openly non-binary person. I think that um, I personally have learned a lot from Quinn already. I expect that I will learn a lot from them going forward um, because they are very open, I think, um, about you know what they're going through, what trans people are going through. And I think that that's a conversation that we don't have often enough in sport. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's going to be, it's one of those sort of underlying moments that you maybe don't think about the minute the whistle is blown but when we get to look back on what this win meant it's not just going to mean something on the field because of Quinn and I think that that's a much bigger legacy um, than you know winning a gold medal which really is saying something so um, you know, I, I know that there is a lot of conversations particularly about trans women's places, in sports and I think that Quinn has been an incredible advocate um, for inclusion in sport. Um, so really happy for them today um, because there's just there's just sort of that added effect of this gold medal win. Very well said. And uh, I'm with you there. You know, I've learned a lot from from Quinn and the conversations that I've been able to have during these Olympic Games. And you know, Diana Matheson made a great point about, um, you know, how we look at Christine Sinclair as Canadians and celebrating the all time international goal scorer. You know, Quinn will now, you know, have a have a stage uh, to their own, um, which is also, you know, pretty incredible. And, and for Canadians, you know, to, uh, to to be able to celebrate two incredible players and two incredible people. Um, it's just a, it's a special day for Canadian soccer. So if we sound like we're repeating ourselves a little bit, I, I know certainly I am. Um, it's it's because being in a gold medal position is a is a brand new feeling, and Laura, it's a very good feeling. 
Yeah, I think that people watching this video should go ahead and take a shot for how many times they've said incredible during this uh, video. And I think they'll be pretty drunk by the end of it. But here you go, Friday post-match drinking game for you. Uh, Laura, being able to work with you at the Toronto Star has been incredible for me. So thank you very much for always being available and for coming on Tokyo Daily again. Oh, Dunlop, I've already cried enough today. Get out of here. Perhaps when these Olympic Games are over, I will look to add to my vocabulary. I'll spend the time doing a lot of reading. Another big gold medal game goes tonight. The men's U.S. men's basketball team looking to win their fourth straight gold medal at the Olympics. Standing in their way, though, Nicolas Batum's France. He got the French into the final. They beat the U.S. at the beginning of this tournament, remember. The opening game. France are a perfect 5-0. This is their first Olympic final since losing to the U.S. in Sydney in 2000. You can see that game at 10.30. Doug Smith will join me on Tokyo Daily tomorrow. We'll talk all about it. Read the latest on the TorontoStar.com. Laura with a couple of pieces today about Canada's gold medal win on the pitch. And Joe Callahan with a great piece about Andre DeGrasse's gold medal run in the 200 meter. Hopefully you thought this was another medal winning show. I know I did. Just two left on Tokyo Daily. Thanks for watching on the Toronto Star's YouTube page. Remember, you can listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brendan Dunlop. Thanks for kicking it with me.